Nils is the director of Wallow Resources and I think is not only locally one of the imaginative people around natural resources, but actually regionally and nationally one of the imaginative people with an imaginative organization uh, dealing with natural resource, economic, and social issues. And uh, I think you will see that he can, he can weave all of these things together. Uh, just, you know, background, he grew up in Norway and, and uh, Virginia. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> went to school at, went to school at uh, w uh, Williams, where he's going to take his daughter in the next week or two. And then uh, got a master's in forestry at Oxford University. And has worked in Australia and Africa. I don't know where all that. I say he, he left the world to come to Wallow County. And we're happy that he stuck around. Thanks very Go much. Ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, uh, I'm the executive director of Wallow Resources. I've been with Wallow Resources since 1999. And I came here after working uh, overseas in uh, what the rest of the world calls community-based natural resource management. And I was very inspired by uh, the partnerships, the public-private partnerships and the empowerment of local communities and local landowners to manage resources, but in partnership with NGOs and government agencies and the things that were being accomplished in Norway, in Botswana, Zimbabwe, Australia. And I was curious whether anything like that was happening in the United States. <laughs> and as I looked around in my network of uh, both college and professional friends, um, a college friend of mine was working at Sustainable Northwest and said, you should really check out Willow County. And my wife and I had never been to Oregon in our life. We'd never been, I don't think, anywhere in the Pacific Northwest. And so we pull out the atlas and look at Enterprise and Joseph, and <laughs> like, wow, that really is the end of the road. Uh, but uh, we came out, that uh, came out in March, April of '99. Met with board members, the community, Forest Service people, and you know, I was very, very motivated. And my wife was gracious enough to uh, to agree to give it a shot. And we've been here 15 years and, and raised our two kids, and uh, and are very much in love with this county. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, and I, you know, when you start planning for a talk like this, I had big. I, I could probably could have gone on for three hours, and I came up with a grand title. And now I better shrink it down. Uh, what we're really going to talk about is sort of where we are at the start of the 21st century with the forest conditions in Wallow County, you know, more broadly on the Wallow Whitman National Forest, and in the Blue Mountain Eco Region of, of Eastern Oregon. Um, and what that looks like, it, why it looks like that, and why forestry, the needs for forestry today are different, and some of the challenges that places for our operations and uh, merchandising and, and marketing of, of that material. And a big, a big part of the story is fire. And we're going to see that again in the next slide. There's going to be a fair number of <laughs> graphs and data here, and I'll try not to bore you to death. But um, a team of students from OSU, from Oregon State University, put this together, these histiographs together. Uh, and, they're, and basically what you're looking at is sort of dry pine type forests, a little bit more with a tiny bit more moisture, but still dry Douglas fir pine type forests, and a little bit more moisture in the mixed conifer type forest. And, and the, the main point of this graph is that there's a significant change at 1900. Um, and uh, and, and I'll, I'll just go on and skip to the next one. This is a little bit heavy, but again, you see the same pattern. So here's that pattern from before. This is the pattern from fire scars of the known fires in this area. Uh, and you can see this huge concentration of fires from 1500 to 1900, and then it pretty much ends. And um, Rich and probably other people in this room can talk a lot more about exactly what happened there. But in a, in a general sense, we know that with the displacement of the Nez Perce tribe and the other native peoples in this region, there was less, you know, we lost their use of fire. 
And then there was just a greater tendency for the new settlers to put fire out. Fire was not their friend. They didn't, that was not their mentality. That was not a technology that they, they used uh, frequently. And so there was a, a loss of the uh, native fire and a greater effort to put out natural fires from 1900 on. And, it, and it bega that, that began to change the forest long before we ever began logging the forest. Okay. We did, of course, log the forest. <coughs> and and um, the history of forestry in the blues is, you know, with a lot of tiny mills and the railroad logging, and we don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, and it peaked here in, in the mid-1980s. And this is, this is for the Willow Whitman National Forest, but if I did it for Willow County, it would look exactly the same. Uh, and then in 1994, when the national forest system nationwide shifted from sustained yield harvesting as a primary objective to ecosystem management, you saw a dramatic decline in harvest, right? It, very, very dramatic. And, and if you're from this area, you know that that had a big impact on our communities. We lost our sawmills. Uh, we lost about uh, 330, when in 1994, 95, we lost about 330 direct jobs in the milling industry, over time we've lost 250 out of 300 jobs in the Forest Service, uh, and then we lost all the associated jobs, the service industries that support uh, the Forest Service and the, and the mill, milling industries from forest contractors to, to all the other support services. So it has, and that led to a loss in, in school enrollment amongst other things that Rich and I will <laughs> raise at a different occasion. But it, you know, it, it had a big impact. But beyond the impact that it had on the community, this had an impact on our forest. And, and again, just to sort of see, you'll see sort of this decline in, in uh, this is the Willow Whitman. We've got a huge standing volume of trees that's growing uh, at a significant, uh, you know, 627 board feet per, per acre, and then mortality is about a third of that, and, and then you're selling now what's left, you know, you're selling, you know, what, 3% of what's left. And so, you, so the story there is that the forest is growing. We're continuing to add biomass. We're continuing to add stems. And there's a tremendous amount of small diameter material building up. And across the Blue Mountains, you've got the exact same story. It doesn't matter whether we're central Washington, northeast Washington, north central Washington, et cetera. These stories are exactly the same. You've got uh, a historical um, density in dry forests and a current density, so a much increase. And it doesn't mean that every stand is increased, because you can see on the range of stand conditions that some of them are consistent with the, with the historic pattern, but the majority of them have much higher stand density, more stems per acre. But they're missing their large tree component, because the logging was targeted at the large overstory trees. Right? And we targeted Ponderosa Pine, we targeted Western Larch, we targeted Doug Fir, and we took out those big trees that, that play a very important function in the forest from a forest structure, biodiversity, habitat point of view. They're also the most fire resilient, fire resistant types of trees in the forest. <clears throat> and that story, like when we work with the Forest Service here, this is from Joseph uh, Crick Watershed. <clears throat> and, and this is data that Larry Knoll and Kyle Couch and his whole team of foresters pulled together for us. But we look at the conditions in the Lower Joseph Creek watershed today, and it's the same thing. We see this preponderance of, of high density stands missing the large tree component. That's in, in dry Pinestein stands. And then in cool Grand Fir stands, the same thing. A preponderance of this heavy density, high density stands missing the diversity of forest types missing the lower stand density types, both at the young age and at the old ages. <clears throat> and now, <clears throat> the next thing that's overlaying that history is a rapid increase in wildfire activity and the impact, again, like we saw pre-1900, of wildfire across the landscape. That's nationwide. 
This is for Wallowa County, and I haven't, I've got the data that goes beyond 2007, but the story is the same. And spending a lot of money fighting, fighting wildfire across the West. We spend uh, over, the federal government spends over $2 billion a year fighting wildfire, and the state of Oregon broke a record on its own, spending over $125 million last year. <clears throat> and the fires are getting bigger. Uh, total, total acres burned per year or per decade has been increasing, uh, and, and the largest wildfires are getting bigger. <clears throat> and the season for large fires is getting much longer. And that relates back to uh, the, uh, Professor North's presentation before with sort of the direct evidence that our climate is changing. We're having warmer, drier uh, summers, and we're reaching uh, this lower uh, fuel humidity index rating that allows for a, a very high energy release component, which creates these very big fires. And, and the forecast for the future is not any better. It's actually quite worse in that um, we're looking, we're up here in this dark zone of uh, anticipation of, you know, 100 to 150 percent increase in wildfire activity uh, over, the, over this century. We're also seeing an increase in fatalities. Um, fighting wildfires with that increased activity and the more difficult environment that they're working in as development has encroached on the, on the forest and, and, and we're trying to protect structures in more remote and difficult terrain, it's creating more dangerous uh, firefighting um, environment. <clears throat> and, they're, and they're getting a, a lot more expensive. Um, and that, that all has its own implications, but for us, it comes back to, um, you know, what do we do about a stand like that? So this is an actual project that a lot of resources worked on with the, with the Forest Service. And, and this was a question that was first posed to me um, back, back when I arrived. When I first got here, uh, Diane Daggett, who was the executive director when I arrived, uh, said, you know, don't, I'm not expecting you to do any work for the first couple of weeks. Just go out and meet as many people as you can, get their feedback on what would be a good place for Willow Resources to really demonstrate our mission and purpose, which is to ma maintain the working forest lands or working landscapes of Willow County and the jobs and livelihoods associated with that. Where could we begin to have an impact? And, and because the original motivation for the creation of all our resources was with the loss of the mills, the loss of employment, the impact on the school and the hospital that resulted from that, there was a lot of attention to the forest conditions. And, and, what, and, and whether I was talking to foresters or landowners or ranchers or school people, everybody was saying we need to find a market for small diameter trees. We recognize that the future in terms of restoring the forest, reducing the risk of wildfire, trying to restore the type of structural diversity and, and, and ecological diversity that existed in our forest pre-1900 requires a lot of active management and a reduction of those higher density, small diameter stands. And that that's gonna be a mixture of mechanical treatment and prescribed burning. It's not one or the other, because in a condition like that, you don't want to just set a torch, right? Um, so we started looking at the mechanics of doing this, and this one was really instructive. Mike Mahon did the logging on this one, Bear Creek logging, and, uh, and kept very, it was kind of done as a research contract, kept very detailed uh, measurements of everything he was harvesting. And so you can see 56% of the trees that he handled <coughs> were less than seven inches in diameter. Material that's less than seven inches in diameter has no market, right? So 56% of the material he was asked to cut, there was, there was not, no mill that would take that material for him. So we began looking very hard at, okay, how do, how do we deal with that? Because we can't anticipate 
the federal government to step up with the amount of money it would take to deal with the millions of acres across the West that are in this condition. And they're worse in worse condition the farther south you go because they've lost all milling infrastructure. They've lost their forest contractors. So that active management graph of, of cutting, et cetera, that I showed earlier is much, much worse in the southwest. So these stand densities in these, in, in these hot, dry pine stands are, are much higher than we're even seeing here. So, and, and we began to look at this, okay, how do, how do we handle this? And I have probably in my office, I don't know how many people have been in my office, but there's a lot of reports in there, but 50% of them are probably marketing studies trying to figure out how you deal with small wood. In any event, we knew that we had, uh, you know, we had forest conditions that had a tremendous amount of wildfire risk, that wildfire has a broad range of of uh, impacts that fire in itself is not bad but high intensity large ext you know very extensive uh, wildfire can be bad particularly at the rates and severities that it's occurring today and so we want to try to reduce those fuel loads allow for fire to happen in a less destructive fashion uh, and and figure out a way to, to pay for that treatment and we came up with biomass utilization as, as, uh, as the natural goal. Now back in, the, in like 2003, um, everybody was thinking about biomass utilization. And we got some money to look at what it would take to put in a biomass power plant in Northeast Oregon. <clears throat> and this is a cost curve as a function of the, of the fuel cost. And this was the you know, approximate rate of electricity in Northeast Oregon. And if you were going to build a five megawatt plant, which was all we thought we could build in terms of building something that was not overwhelming the supply, that we wouldn't build something at 50 megawatts and then rush out and cut a bunch of trees and in 10 years not have any fuel left to, to fuel this thing, right? So we picked something we thought we could sustain long, long into the future. You know, and we end up at about $8 a green ton is, is what you could afford to pay to produce electricity at the going power rate. It's actually misleading because you, the Pacific Power would never give you that rate. Uh, they, they only would do that if you could net meter five megawatts, <laughs> which you can't do. You know, so they'd really be down here at about 3.3 cents, you know, but, it doesn't matter because you're going to see that we never could have, we, we couldn't hit any of these targets, right? So this was the a cost curve for what it would cost to bring in 85,000 green tons to fuel a five megawatt plant, and it was $30 a ton versus eight or you know possibly four. Um, even that's misleading because that study is suggesting that a fair amount of the material you're going to get uh, would which would be normal in any other forest industry situation would be mill residues. But we have no mills left, right? So all of this material would need to come from the woods. And when you factor that in, this cost curve changes and you end up at about $49 a green ton if you were gonna to try to support a five megawatt power plant in Wallawa or La Grande or Baker City. So we said, all right, we're not gonna be building a big power plant. What are we gonna do? And then we began to look, we backed away from the problem and said, let's think about how logging takes place today. And is there a different way in which we can impact or design the system in the woods to reduce some costs? And then think about a different way of utilizing material so that we're not dependent on one final product in, in one market. And this is a simplified cartoon that just talks about, you know, typically there's a single grip harvester in the woods, it goes to some kind of skidder or forwarder, and it comes to a landing site, and there's multiple landings because of, or there's multiple sorts per landing. Because you're sorting your pine and your dug fir and, and larch together and your grand fir and white woods in a different pile and you're sorting it by diameters and if there's a special market from a buyer for something you're sorting that separately then you have a tremendous amount of different sorts and they're all getting put on <coughs> log trucks and sent in various directions usually with a fairly big 
landing impact, a footprint of, of activity at that landing site. And then all the material you haven't put on, on a truck, you're burning in slash piles either at the landing site or in the woods. <clears throat> so we decided that maybe we could do that differently. <clears throat> that we would still have the forwarder in the woods and, and, and I mean the single grip in the woods and the forwarder or skidder, but we just go, we try to design something that would be down to two or maybe three sorts. And in a very simplistic way, you put your long logs directly on a truck and you ship them directly to a mill. And everything that isn't a long log, 33 to 40 feet long, you put on a truck and bring to a central campus where that merchandising takes place. And there's a variety of reasons to do this. Um, one of which is that as, as soon as the Forest Service harvest rates went down, they also went down on a per acre basis. So, you know, when I got here in the old days, they might have been cutting, and I don't know if you guys know what board feet, so just think relatively, you know, 6,000 to 10,000 board feet per acre. When I got here, they were cutting about three and a half to 4,000 board feet per acre. The last five to six years before we built a campus down in, in Malawa with private par partners, they were cutting at 1,800 board feet per acre. So really light harvest per acre because they were just going after that smaller diameter material. And that meant that the landings, if anybody's driven around the Forest Service roads, uh, some of them very circuitous, uh, <laughs> and with you know, spur roads that dead end to nothing, it meant that the landings had very small volumes. And therefore, you couldn't really, you, you couldn't get, like in that old picture, you couldn't justify multiple sorts because no one sort would fill a full truckload. So you're expecting a truck to then go to multiple landing sites and the whole, the efficiency of the thing fell apart. So this idea appealed to the contractors. We talked a lot with them as we started thinking through this. And they said, you know, that would simplify things on the Forest Service. It would allow them to be more efficient with their operations in the woods, and it should reduce the cost per harvest of those types of conditions on the Forest Service. It would also reduce breakage because instead of combining long logs and short logs on a truck, and then when they try to sort that at the mill, they often break some of the long logs. We could send them a pure truckload of, of long logs. And when this truckload of all the other material came to us, the very first thing we would do is merchandise out the short saw logs and ship pure truckloads of short saw logs again to the mill. But the beauty of this was that we would look at a lo the mix of logs and sort them and merchandise them for highest and best value. So build a system that could make multiple products that met sort of the species mix that we had, the size mix that we had, and we ended up building a campus down in, in Malawi, and the county supported us. More importantly, uh, two young entrepreneurs, David and Jesse Schmidt, jumped up to be the majority owners and managers of this fully built system. But a system that allows us to ship all this small diameter material in, merchandise out the short saw logs, then process the other material to make bundled firewood, post and pole, hot poles, densified heat logs, clean chips that can be sell, sold on either to Wallula, to the pulp and paper industry, or to Enterprise School District, or Heat Their School District. And then all the waste underneath these overhead conveyors goes into a combined heat and energy plant that net meters electricity, about 70 to 80 kilowatts of electricity to offset all the power demand, not all, sorry, they'll end up being about 40 to 50% of the power demand of the, of the rest of the equipment, and provide all the heat that's needed to dry firewood, dry the densified heat logs, uh, and eventually even provide heat, heat into the buildings to make those uh, a better atmosphere for, for the workers on the firewood production line. <clears throat> and there's a whole series of things, if you're interested in this, there's a whole series of benefits that we're working with OSU, ODF, and the Forest Service to, um, to quantify how much we've reduced the cost, how much we've improved the utilization so that we're no longer burning big slash piles in the woods. Three years ago, this county burned over 400,000 tons of slash in the woods on one landowner. 
right? 400,000 tons. Enterprise school district is using, uh, what are they using right now in terms of tonnage of wood? I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> they're using 600 tons to heat the entire school district. And in the woods and slash piles, we burnt 400,000 tons of slash, mm -hmm. right? So we're trying to minimize that production of slash, bring that in, convert that to useful business process heat and electricity or other products. Uh, and reduce the cost of, of, of treating these vast acres uh, that are in need of restoration. And what it's meant is that there's actually 26 people working down at the Integrated Biomass Resource Site in Malawa right now. Um, we're producing, as I said, renewable energy and we're providing significant benefits back to forest management by uh, reducing the cost to treat those dense, uh, small diameter stands um, and create more of a market-based incentive to do that kind of restoration work. Um, that may be what I was gonna say, because I ended, yeah, it's 12.30, it's perfect. <laughs> uh, so thanks. Yes? On the power plant, that, is that something that still could happen in the future? I mean, when you figured in the numbers did you think like how many maybe less million dollar fires that would be fought or how many people would get jobs? I mean, was those numbers all put into thinking? So we try to do uh, that kind of life cycle cost analysis. Um, there's limits to what we're able to do and then, and then motivate uh, financial backers to back, right? Because it ends up, as you start adding those other costs, you're trying to convince them to, in their minds to subsidize something, <clears throat> right? And, and, it, and, it, and it becomes a more and more challenging argument as that cost gets bigger and bigger, the capital cost gets bigger and bigger. And the, second, the second thing for us was that on a, on a uh, per acre or per thousand board foot basis, what we designed in Wallawa has a much higher employment ratio, much, much higher than a power plant, right? Um, so, so we like this design for that reason too, because part of the motivation was not just uh, find a way to restore the woods, but it was also find a way to create more jobs associated with restoration, right? So, but the power plant, you would still need the other group, wouldn't you, to get the wood prepped for the power plant? Or? Oh, you could, no, no, I see what you're saying. Um, you could. I mean, the, 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 you know, it's at one point the challenge is going to be, um, well, I mean, the biggest challenge will be the economics of it because nobody right now wants to build a purely biomass power plant in one of these small communities when electricity is already really cheap here. It would make, you know, it makes a lot of sense in Alaska, it makes a lot of sense in Hawaii, and it makes a lot of sense in other places with higher costs of electricity. but. It doesn't make a lot of sense now. Now, if you had a bigger demand for the thermal energy that's released in the production of electricity, uh, if you had additional business process needs, or there were community centers that needed heating, or community swimming pools that needed heating, or greenhouses you know, that needed heat like they do in British Columbia, and you, and you could factor that in, then you, could, then you could begin to make something larger pencil. Mm -hmm. I ate at a restaurant in uh, Spokane, still there, called the Steam Plant, <clears throat> and it, uh, its main purpose was thermal energy and heated much yep. of downtown Spokane. So it's, it seems like urban areas would benefit from, from, from having a biomass power plant in their midst. That so, um, not necessarily Wild well, County, you're getting kind of out of your, <coughs> your range here, but, but isn't that, wouldn't that be... The case? Um, th there's, as Susan said, there's a, there's a significant interest in the state of Oregon in, in um, distributed heat systems or heating districts. Uh, we're working with the city of Enterprise right now to look at the possibility of a small biomass power plant that could support the city hall the, and the fire hall. Uh, um, Ralph, help me out. You're doing this with me. The uh, public library, the Odd Fellows, and Pioneer Guest Home. And a little bit in the EM&M. Right. And so that would be a demonstration of a slightly 
you know, a, of a small district heating system, um, and uh, it, at the right scale, it begins to make a lot of sense. And the, and the question is, how much do each of those connections actually use in electricity? How much would you save, and does it justify the additional costs of engineering the connection? But <clears throat> Enterprise School District, just as an example, although you know, Enterprise School District was the first school in the state of Oregon to switch to a modern biomass boiling system. And being the very first, right, they ran into a few challenges. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that could be the subject of another talk, but the, it, the short and simple version is that um, wires got crossed between the school district and the local businesses that were prepared to provide fuel and the type of fuel they were prepared to provide with the design team on the general contractor that ended up designing to a different fuel spec and the communication and coordination wasn't there. As a result, that general contractor has had to compensate the school district significantly for that error in design. Um, you know, not all of that makes it out to the public. What we know is that Ken Kunkel and Brad were frustrated, <laughs> right? But um, today, uh, that system, Enterprise School District used to burn like 45,000 gallons of heating oil a year. Uh, that one school district with a 100,000 square foot footprint, and now it burns less than 6,000 gallons. So a significant reduction in heating oil use and a massive cash flow savings. Uh, between seventy to hundred thousand dollars a year, depending on the number of heating days. So how cold the winter is and how long it's it is cold. Um, so that's just one example. And if you look around the state, because now I think there's 19 or 20 of these installations across the state, and they're all showing similar types of uh, cash savings and 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 uh, petroleum savings. And so we're hopeful for something similar, you know, for the city of Enterprise. And that's kind of the way we'd be looking at it. I mean, like, that's one second. Minneapolis-St. Paul and Montpelier, Vermont, they both have much bigger systems like you're talking about Spokane has. Brand new, modern biomass boilers. And the University of Idaho, Moscow, has a big biomass boiler that pipes heat across the campus. So those bigger systems are definitely possible. Uh, you know, we think within Willow County, given a whole bunch of factors and, and that a lot of people have different types of heat sources, so it's hard to make it all work, that sort of picking and choosing like we did in Enterprise and maybe in Wallowa with the school district, the city hall, the senior center, you know, some of those things, you could build some smaller ones. I think you answered my question. I was wondering how it was distributed in hot water, apparently. It, well, the engineer's here, but primarily hot water. <laughs> So, there's a really big, uh, I mean, it's not biomass heat, but in Boise, there's a, they have a hot water heating system from the geothermal well. Right. It's got a long history. Right. Over 100 years. City of Honda Falls. Yeah. 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 Please. I have a question about the relative health of local forest. I live up the Lost Dean Canyon. Yeah. You go up toward Tupan, it gets, who's a nice statistical description, I think, of, of what I see. Scraggly right. trees, over a uh, very dense, uh, a lot of yep. dead standing timber. You know, to my eye, it looks like a match would make a, a big mess of the place. This weekend, we were over out of halfway uh, up Richland. We hiked up the East Fork of Eagle Creek on the south side of Allow. It was radically different. Uh, to my non-professional eye, it looked a lot healthier. The, it wasn't quite as dense. There were some very big and healthy looking trees. There was mixed uh, age. Yep. Mixed, and so I'm. Um, Help me understand why. First of all, do you agree that that that, that, that there's a there's a health difference between this at least parts of south part of the Wallowa and, and north side of the mountains? And if you agree that there is a difference, why is there a difference? So uh, what I'll tell you is there's a difference like all over the all place. over the place. Yeah, <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> And you've got a, a variety of reasons. So, um, one of them is the is the space, the decision space, the management space that the Forest Service and the public has to operate on the Wallowa Whitman National Forest. At least on the public lands in Wallowa County, there's about 750,000 acres of national forest system that's truly forested. 
Um, there's a, a lot more grassland, of course, and, and rocks and ice and everything, but there's 750,000 that's got forest on it. When you put the wilderness designations on and you put uh, the, the restrictions in Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area, you put old growth reserves, you put research natural areas, you put the riparian buffers on them, um, and, and like in Lostine where you have a riparian buffer and a wild and scenic <laughs> river corridor, uh, your opportunity to operate shrinks dramatically. And so in Malawi County, there's about um, 200,000 acres left that's, that is uh, more simple to do active management in, that there's less restrictions on your ability to operate and try to manage that forest. The majority of it, 65% of it, has serious restrictions, and in, in the climate of litigation that we've been in and conflict, the Forest Service shies away from anything that's complicated. They try to focus on the things that are more simple to achieve and less likely to result in, 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 a, in a protracted legal battle. So that's, so I would have to know when you walked up a half creek, you'd have out of halfway what, you, what kind of ground you were in. And the other thing, obviously, is that we were an eagle cap, by the way. It was eagle. Yeah. Okay. The other thing would be the forest type, right? And and the past history of fire, because I don't know if you were also in a lodgepole stand like you are in 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 Lostine, um, when you were going up Eagle Creek. See, see, we didn't see a lot of lodgepole. Yeah. So it would have been a different forest type with yeah. probably a little different history. But but I think um, you know I I don't know I kind of glossed over it. I mean there's. There's, uh, there's about 1.5 million acres in the Blue Mountain region that there's broad consensus needs restoration that is overstocked, like, like you look at it in Lusty. Uh, it's different, it's not all the same. You know, some is pine, you know, ponderosa pine, and some is dug fir, and some is mixed conifer. But, but it, and so it doesn't all need the same treatment, but there's agreement, there's about 1.5 million acres that needs attention. And today we're only effectively getting 30, you know, sometimes 50, up to 50,000, but just a small piece of it on what we know needs restoration today. And, those, and that land is still growing, right? I mean, the trees are still growing. So we, we're a long way from catching up with the problem of healthy forests and, and, and reduced threat of wildfire. And that's why solutions like this are, uh, are excited, exciting in the region. I mean, uh, people are begging David Schmidt and I to see if we can start one in Seneca and see if in Klamath and in Warm Springs and you know up up north in in south in in southeast Washington um, because everybody's trying to figure out how to do this. Because if we just do it with service contracts, I mean, the two options to you know there's kind of three options I guess today. Four. One is to do nothing and. Wait for wait for the lightning strikes, uh, or the insect disease and, and the collapse, um, which you know I mean, yeah, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, you know one one would be for the taxpayers to pay for that, and depending on where you are is really really expensive. So, you know the cheapest that we've seen is sort of three hundred dollars an acre up on Mount Howard where there's been some work, but limited work. It was more like a thousand dollars an acre. Uh, and you add that by 1.5 million acres in need of restoration, and you're talking about a you know very hefty tax bill. Um, and um, prescribed burning is being used. Prescribed burning is a tool. Looking at putting fire in when the moisture content is higher, so you, you and you could manage it better. But in some of those stands, like I showed, you wouldn't want to do that. And so mostly prescribed burning is happening at the more lower risk acres. Uh, that will help create boundaries to the extent of large fire in the future, but they're not really helping us address the acres most at risk. And that's why I think there's a growing consensus. You know, uh, the TNC is a huge advocate for this, of the need to actually get people back on the ground, cutting out that smaller diameter trees, particularly those shade tolerant trees, the grand fir that have come in that have the low hanging branches that create the ladder fuels for fire to move from, from a ground fire into the canopy. Um, and there's just more and more consensus that that needs to be done. 
And now, and then the de devil's in the details about exactly how and where. And that's happening now, which is kind of exciting in these processes of forest collaboratives, where <clears throat> stakeholders are coming together, convened by a county government or a nonprofit or an independent facilitator, and reaching agreement about where they think the priorities for treatment are, how that treatment should take place, and then going to the Forest Service and say, you know, we've got this broad spectrum of agreement from industry groups to environmental groups to livestock permittees, firewood cutters, recreationists, and we all agree that this would be a good way forward. And if you pursue NEPA with that, know that you have our support and hopefully to show them a path that would avoid some of the legal conflicts that they've been in for the last 20 years. So we lead one of those for the Wallah Whitman National Forest, another group does for the Mount Huer, one for the Umatilla. And, and I think we're gonna, that's gonna help um, accelerate restoration in a way that people can feel good about it. There's still gonna be arguments, right? Why did you cut that tree? That happens all the time. But I think at a large landscape scale, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see improvement. In what kind of time frame? <laughs> well, Wallah County's gonna come first. Uh, <laughs> Thanks to the leadership of the county commissioners uh, and the work of Wallow County's NRAC, uh, you know, we started back in 2001 with a collaborative process. Uh, and I, we were maybe the second or third group in the Pacific Northwest that started a forest collaborative. There's 55 forest collaboratives from Western Montana and Northern California now. Because we had that early history and we invested in the, upper Jos in the lower Joseph Creek watershed, when the chief of the Forest Service and, and the regional forester agreed on the need for an east side restoration strategy and they put $40 million of additional money into working in eastern Oregon and eastern Washington, um, our project rose to the top uh, as the pilot project to demonstrate that we could work on a larger landscape and that we could maintain uh, uh, stakeholder support for a larger landscape effort. So up, you're, within about two weeks, where there'll be a draft EIS for the Lower Joseph Creek Watershed Restoration Project. It'll have 16,000 acres of active management of forest. Um, it'll put a lot of people back to work. It'll be, there'll be fuel reduction work. There'll be range allotment improvements, riparian restoration projects, a broad range of projects. Actually, OSU economists calculated that there could be as much as 200 jobs <coughs> resulting, if this whole project is approved as we presented it to the Forest Service, it could support about 200 jobs for five years. And uh, I, th I can't remember how many millions of dollars, but it was over $50 million of local economic benefit into Northeast Oregon. And, and our hope would be that that demonstrates we can do it. We get off to the next watershed as a stakeholder group, and we maintain that momentum and, and get more support from <coughs> from Congress and the Forest Service to invest in this way forward. Oh. I was just gonna ask what you think the potential to replicate um, what you've done at integrated biomass campus is. I know you're getting bombarded. So, so yeah, no, that's a huge, huge question. And, and we get bombarded and there's no doubt um, that, I mean, actually Boise Cascade announced on Friday that they are gonna build at their Elgin plant a, a new log utilization center, which is very similar to what I just showed you. It, and basically they said they're gonna take pulp logs down to a two inch top uh, and they're gonna merchandise out short saw logs and then they're gonna convert the rest of it into chips. <clears throat> and the chips will either go to their particle board plant or to Wallula, to the paper plant. Because their particle board plant in <clears throat> Island City um, is a very high quality particle board because of the percentage of ponderosa pine in it. And their sales are just, you know, growing rapidly. And their only shortfall is supply of ponderosa pine residuals. But if we work with other communities, the question is less about is the concept replicable as are which markets are they going to go into? Uh, the biggest single item of sales from the Wallow market, Wallow campus, is bundled firewood, and and that. Company in Wallawa, I think, is the third biggest producer of bundled firewood in the Western United States. Um, so we don't want to help somebody start and then just like torpedo our market for bundled yeah. firewood. 
Uh, <laughs> so the question is, sort of looking at their log basket and product mix, what other markets could they get into? And there are other markets, but it, 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 it means that we, we, you know, we need to keep innovating. We need to keep thinking about the different products and market opportunities that, that allow for these systems to coexist. So is uh, the Boise, are they talking about a generation component? Uh, so yes, because so yes and no. I mean, in 2007, they put in a brand new biomass boiling system, uh, but biomass boilers, as you probably know, uh, they don't like to go on and off, right? And when they were when they moved down to one shift and slightly less than one shift, they didn't really have enough continuous demand to run the biomass boiler, so they switched back to natural gas. <coughs> But, but uh, they were very clear that if, they're, they're, if the log supply allows them to move to two shifts, they will resume using the biomass boiler. Yeah. Nils, um, I, it's incredibly difficult to, to, to establish any kind of norms in all of this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you started with that slide about that spike up and of timber harvest, and I think I moved here in 1971. There was one mill with one shift which had maybe 50 jobs. Right. It isn't until 73 that that Rogie comes in, or 72, and then we'll, you know right. two more mills pile on, right. and we have this huge harvest, and that's all related to national politics right. as well as the local politics. Right. And I'm th you know, but during that time before that blip. We had a lot of loggers, and a lot of logs were going out of the county, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and the, that big yard in Malawa was full of trucks, yep. <laughs> and they were going out. So, and, and then you said that, you know, at that time they were harvesting big trees, so they were doing other things, but the, the to it would be, it's almost like apples and oranges to compare um, employment then and employment later, and, and all too often, we see that spike up as the time. You're talking about 300 Forest Service jobs. In 1971, there were probably 40 year round Forest Service okay. jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And that was before. And then you go look at the privatization of the Forest Service. Right. I mean, right. it's really, I like what you're talking about in terms of trying to figure out all the options and the best way to go forward. I just think when you, when you measure against the past, it really becomes difficult. <laughs> and I don't know the past as well as you do. <laughs> well, it's just, yeah. In fact, I want to see that slide. I want to see what happened in 1730 when the Nespers got the horse. That, whether, uh, whether they burned them more. I'll, I'll give you the slide. <laughs> <laughs> now, did they start burning more when they got horses? Maybe. I don't know. They got cattle in 1840. Did they start yeah. burning more? Yeah. And, I, I, and I'm not, I mean, you know, the... Um, when you start looking at the historic reference conditions and, and, and use that, you've always got to use it with, you know, yeah. as just a point of reference because the future is always going to be different. And, and we need to be thinking about, you know, we, and that's kind of our whole ethos at well, our resources is continue to innovate, continue to collaborate, bring in new ideas so that we figure out that, you know, make sure we're trying to use the best possible science that we're aligning you know, and building public support for what we're trying to do, uh, and and doing it in partnerships because we're too small to do anything on our own. That has an impact at the scale we want to have an impact on, right? You might give your two-minute blurb about resiliency versus sustainability because I think that's what you're saying. Won't you? Okay. <laughs> so we we've been. Um, there, you know, resilience is now being thrown around a lot. And when I worked down in Zimbabwe, I worked with a group of ecologists that uh, that created something that's now formally known as the Resilience Alliance. And the whole uh, concept is that, uh, and it's not it's not really any different than moving from sustained yield management to ecosystem management, except that it embodies this notion that social and ecological systems are integrated. And that we can't be just trying to talk about ecological sustainability or, or resilience. We need to think about uh, resilience of a united social ecological system. 
Um, and that brings in politics, it brings in markets and finance and economics, right? And that you're looking at a system that is going to go through booms and busts, right? And the question is not to try to stop that, but to stop the, the, the potential for a boom and bust to send you over a threshold down a trajectory that is less favorable, right, to that community. And, and there's a lot of different examples people use for that. I mean, the, um, the nutrification of large water systems, right, uh, is an example of shifting a system state into something that is far less desirable and then has huge costs to try to recreate or, or to restore. In our view, in like Willowa County, what motivates me is that I don't believe uh, in a future of um, that we achieve our conservation and sustainability goals by locking land up, by adding more protected areas. I believe that we do it by working together as partners and motivating good stewardship, right? And that we don't have enough money to, to create national parks and protected areas and wilderness areas everywhere. We don't learn anything from doing that. Uh, and, and, we, and what we end up doing is shifting the emphasis of production to high intensity industrial types of land use, whether it's farming or plantation forestry or whatever it is. And I'm really motivated by communities that want to be good stewards of working landscapes and figure out a way in which they're continually investing in research, adaptation, innovation to maintain a community that supports working families and, and good land stewardship that's, that's contributing to society with products, whether it's beef or grass or timber or energy or whatever it is, but still maintaining the underlying ecological function and, and, and services of clean water, productive soils, wildlife, clean air, etc. And, and, and that's what motivated me when I worked in Southern Africa, and that's really why I came here, because I saw a community that was motivated, you know, in various ways, I think, along the same vision. Uh, certainly, the county's uh, stated custom and culture is very much in line with that. Um, and, and the important thing is that communities like this believe they have allies and partners outside of our own community. Right? To the degree that small rural communities feel like they're under attack all the time, they become insular and defensive, and, and they go into what we call a siege mentality. And then you lose all ability for creative thinking and solution making. You're just always on the defensive. And so building bridges like the Josephi Center does and the Land Trust and Fish Trap and everybody else, and so that we're creating partnerships and beginning to build broader alliances allows us to be more creative thinkers. And also, you know, we don't, you know, we're in a larger ecosystem than Malau County. Sometimes we like to believe that we're sealed off from the rest of the world. <laughs> but, but there's a lot of this that is impacting, you know, into Idaho and Montana and Washington and other parts of Oregon and then at different scales, obviously, we've got the whole Columbia Basin system that's much bigger as well. Uh, and so we have to be partners. And, and uh, um, and that was a long-winded answer to your question, but <laughs> you know, you mentioned that uh, Central or Eastern Washington has a, had a terrible fire season. You barely touched on the fire here in our area. No, you're right. <laughs> I was really worried this morning when I looked at like how many slides I had, and I started deleting slides. <laughs> I was like, Rich told me not to talk for more than 30 minutes. Um, I uh, yeah, you know, this is. Um, that the fire seasons generally, the Pacific Northwest has been hit hard now for several years, and this year and last year, if you combine Oregon and Washington together, you know, there's some of the worst fire seasons we've ever recorded, maybe going back to the 1910, 1912 era. Um, and what is, um, you know, what has everybody anxious is that there is, there is still so many millions of acres that are prone to fire, uh, and uh, and that that fire season is getting longer because the summers are longer and drier, uh, and the projections for precipitation going into the you know 2050 2060 are pretty grim, uh, with a lot less snowpack in the Blue Mountains, um, and and more of it coming in rain, and that's going to allow for again 
you know, a, a faster dry off of those fuel conditions in the forest. So um, this is an issue we've got to tackle and, and we need to get, you know, I also serve on the Board of Forestry and, and the governor came and spoke to us about federal forest land management and his engagement with the Western Governors Association to try to push federal land policy away from single species, single e issues type policies and management objectives to more of an ecosystem management objective. And so that we don't get as tied up as we've gotten in the past about saving the spotted owl or saving the lynx or one thing. And we think more broadly about uh, how do we maintain and improve the overall condition of that ecosystem, recognize that it's changing uh, with climate change, but if it's if it's if it's got diversity and it's got complexity and the underlying soil and water conditions are healthy it's going to express itself in a in a positive way uh and and if we just stay focused on trying to protect one thing it's a little bit self-defeating even the national park says that you know they said that their mission statement for national parks is pretty much impossible in an era of era of climate change because they cannot manage and protect the endemic species of that gazetted area because they're going to migrate. Um, so. so. Where does um, this wonderful demonstration in Wallawa fit with the current uh, forest plan for Wallawa Whitman that's open for comment? And well, it fits, it fits well in that, um, and, the, and the forest supervisors, uh, <coughs> the forest supervisor of the Wallawa Whitman and the forest supervisors is pleased as can be that that exists and the other forest supervisors are jealous that they don't have that market <laughs> uh, because there's going to be a lot of material that is um, smaller than traditional saw log dimensions that is going to need to find a home um, in in what is being proposed in the blue mountain forest plan so it, I mean, it fits extremely well, and it, I mean, and, and the citizens of Willow County knew that 15, 20 years ago. As I said, when when I first got here, they said the number one thing you could do to sort of put Willow resources on the map was to try to create a market for small diameter logs. I hope what I was doing was hitting, giving you a softball to talk about the plan and what you think of it and uh, how one might constructively <laughs> yes. comment on it. Well, the comment's over, isn't it? The well, comment was I, over last week. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not that constructively. Um, um, hmm. I, I think that... Um, I think that the ultimate document, A, I mean, I'm not in favor of 1,400 page doc, management documents. I mean, I, it doesn't, in, in a, when we're dealing, you know, I mean, what, ecosystems, what, is that, what do the guys say? Ecosystems are not only more complex than we think they are, they're more complex than we can even think about them, right? <laughs> and, and if you try to deal with it with 1,400 pages of guidelines and standards and rules, uh, I think you box yourself in a corner. So I don't even like that part of it. Um, I also think it suffered from the tendency that we've seen in Eastern Oregon for a tremendous turnover in leadership. So in the 15 years I've been here, there have been 10 district rangers on, here in Willow County. There's been four or five forest supervisors. And that Blue Mountain Forest Plan has taken 10 years to release. And so you've seen a, this steady transition of leadership, and I don't think the, the team that worked through all that got good direction. So I think, I think it was a bit muddled at the end. Um, I also think that the uh, stated goal of doubling um, undershoots the scale of the problem, doubling the amount of acres they were going to treat and the volume they were going to produce. Um, you know, when I look at the data we've collected, if, you, if I went back to that old graph that where at one point the Willow Whitman was putting out 303 million board feet and now there's something like 25 million board feet. Um, and in Willow County it's similar. I think it was, we peaked at about 66 million board feet and today we're about 4 million board feet. If Willow County was treating enough acres to produce maybe 20 million board feet, so a third of what they were doing at the peak, um, that seems like a really nice sweet spot to shoot for. I and mean, it might shift between 12 and 15 and a little bit higher, but 
that then I think we begin to address the scale of the problem and, and really effectively steward that forest. And, and I think at the end, the Blue Mountain Forest Plan sort of uh, set, a, set a benchmark that was too low. Not, not, not adequate to the scale of the problem that they've otherwise articulated in a lot of other documents and that the chief of the Forest Service and the regional forest service, the regional forester called out. Mills, it's one o'clock and people will probably keep you here for a longer time. I'd like to thank you very, very much. Anybody wants, uh, these are some handouts on the biomass campus and why.